Hey, Pastor Jeremy here. Thank you so much for tuning in to what we hope is a great tool for you to utilize and to grow you in your walk with Jesus. Now, before we get started here, we want to invite you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done that. And then also hit that notification bell so that whenever we post stuff throughout the week, you'll get notification of it so you can use that resource to your benefit, but also you can share it with your friends and family as well. And then also we want to direct you to our website at fbcac.org, where you can find out more about our church family, uh, our different ministries, and then what God is doing and, and how he's using us to impact the kingdom here in Angels Camp, California. Now, here we go. We're about to get into the word of God proclaimed. Please feel free to leave a, a prayer request or, or a comment in the section below. Thank you guys so much for joining with us today. God bless you, and we love you. So the Atlantic Monthly... Uh, once told a story uh, about superstar tenors Jose Carrera, uh, Placido Domingo, and Luciano Pavarotti. Anybody listen to those guys? Okay, a couple of you. All right. You guys are the real smart people uh, because apparently <laughs> that kind of music is associated with smart people. Right. There you go. Um, and they were all performing together in one concert in Los Angeles. Uh, years back. And so this reporter from the Atlantic tried to press uh, the trio on kind of the, the competitiveness. I mean, these guys are world renowned um, singers, right? These are the best of the best. And uh, he tried to kind of bring out their the competitiveness between them. However, uh, Placido Domingo responded with these words. He says, you have to put all of your concentration into opening your heart to the music. He says, you can't be rivals when you're together making music. And the true can be said for the church, right? As we continue examining our vision statement, just piece by piece, we come to the part of the statement that I think may be the most important in enabling us to effectively carry out everything that the vision statement talks about, okay? In other words, our effectiveness and our ability to be the visible hands and feet of Jesus that meet the spiritual, material, and relational needs of others that build the kingdom of God here in Angels Camp and beyond that relies almost exclusively on our ability to make music together. And that will be determined by how many of us are willing to concentrate on the same song to sing that same song. Because I think it's all too common. I know it's in me. And I can probably it's safe to say it's probably in most of you, too. It's just natural to want to sing our own song. Right. Or we'll find others who are already singing the same song and we join with them. Right. Birds of a feather flock together. It's easier that way. We could potentially avoid conflict that way. Or we like to fool ourselves into thinking that it's more familiar. I don't have to learn a new song. Right. It's more comfortable. It doesn't stretch me. And it's in that way that we miss the opportunity to make a truly beautiful song together. Mark Twain used to say that he would put a dog in a cage, a dog and a cat in a cage together to see if they would war against one another, to see if they were to get along, and they, they would. And so then he would throw in a bird and a pig and a goat just to make matters worse, but just after a few minor adjustments, they would all get along. And then he would put in a Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a Methodist, and soon after that, there was not a living thing left, right? And in today's age, I think it's increasingly common for many people to focus primarily on what divides us, on how we differ, then on what unites us. And I see this on both sides of the aisle, so to speak, whatever aisle we want to talk about, right? Conservative, liberal, right, left, whatever, we all do it. And because of that, we're becoming more and more homogenous on each side, meaning each side is just becoming more like itself, which makes everything more polarizing which makes everything more divisive. And yet the beautiful call of the gospel is that the wall of hostility between the two has been broken. So that the things that would typically divide people no longer exist because we are one in Christ, right? There is no, no Jew nor Greek. There is no slave nor free. There's no male nor female. We are all one in Christ. And in our context and today, we may say there is no Republican Christian or Democrat Christian. There's, there's no rich or poor Christian. There's no flatlander Christian or local Christian or whatever, right? No, we are one. 
The gospel should compel us to seek after that which we hold in common as opposed to focusing on how we might differ, nitpicking on individual differences or distinctives, right? After all, was it not the prayer of our Lord Jesus in John 17 in his high priestly prayer to the Father that all believers would be one, just as he and the Father were one? Why? So that the world would know that he sent Jesus to be the Savior of the world. In other words, our unity within the church is a testimony to the validity of Jesus' message to the outside world. We communicate to the world who Jesus is when we stand united together. But one thing we must remember as we begin this talk about unity, this is different than uniformity, okay? Many of us, I think, just probably subconsciously and unintentionally think of uniformity when we talk about unity. Uniformity just seems, just says we, we say all the same thing, we look the same way, we talk the same way, we act the same way, we walk the same way, right? We think the same way. Uh, uniformity, again, I think that's what most people just kind of go to when they think of unity. Again, to put it in our context, you cannot be, according to some out there, you cannot be a true Republican unless you vote for Trump. Uniformity, right? You cannot be a Bible-believing Christian unless you believe in a pre-tribulational rapture or reformed theology. You can't. True worship only involves hymns. The only way to do church is three songs, a 45-minute talk, one song, and we're on with our day, right? Or every church must have X, Y, and Z ministries in order to fit my needs. Like we have these uniformed uh, pictures of how church should be. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't think that denominational differences are insignificant or unimportant, right? There's a reason why we claim the name Baptist and not non-denominational, which are really just Baptists in disguise, right? We're, we're not Presbyterian, we're not Methodist, we're not Catholic. And for some very good reasons, but we have to remember the church was meant to be diverse. It was absolutely designed that way. It was meant to be filled with people from different backgrounds, different instinctual leanings, different distinctives that, yes, make us different from one another. But you know what? We're willing to set those things aside to unite under the common banner of Christ. That is the call on our lives as followers of Jesus. Think of it this way in terms of music. What if everyone in here on a Sunday morning played the piano? Everyone broke out their piano and started playing right? Or everyone, Lord willing, God forbid, we're all bassists, right? You'd probably thank the Lord. No. What if we were all guitarists? Like how monotonous and boring would that music be? However, when the pianist and when the bassist and when the guitarist and when the vocalists come together, we can truly make a beautiful song together. You guys proved that this morning. This is what the church is supposed to be like each of us doing our individual parts based in our individual spiritual gifts, yet at the same time, we're committed to singing the same song together, right? That's our vision statement, guys. That, in a nutshell, is what our vision statement is all about. It's one unified song that the church is saying, yes, we are committed to singing that song together. And so today I'd like us to consider a, a couple different unified passages of Scripture written by one man sent to two different churches in order to see the importance and the beauty of unity. And we're going to kind of uh, put it in the framework of the ABCs of unity. I just I try to make it as memorable and easy for you as possible. So in your outlines, we're going to call them the ABCs of unity. So in both passages that we're going to uh, look at today, we're going to see this concept of a manner of life being talked about and discussed. Okay, A manner of life. And this phrase, manner of life, is going to be communicated in two different ways to two different churches, but by one author. And so to start again, we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 4. So in Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, um, he spends three chapters laying out theology. Okay, He gives us the theological foundations for what it means to be saved, to have your identity in Christ, and then he spends the next three chapters talking about the practical application of that 
theology. So it's exactly what we talked about last week, right? It's theology and pragmatism blended in together. And so beginning in verse 1 of chapter 4, we examine our first passage about unity. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is what Paul writes. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so in in your outlines, uh, we're going to consider the three attitudes to begin with. That's the A in ABC. And these are a true reflection of walking in a manner that is worthy of our calling. And so, again, on the heels of explaining the theology behind our salvation and our identity in Christ, Paul now makes the argument that salvation entails a personal duty to one's personal life, but also to the church as a whole. And that word translated worthy in your outlines is the Greek word axios. It's Again, it's in both passages. Axios is simply a word that means appropriate, okay? It speaks of two things having equal weight. So in context, there's a a balance, there's an equality uh, between your calling and your conduct. Um, So to walk in a manner worthy of your calling would be like us to say, act like a Christian, right? That's basically what Paul is saying. But not how the world might define Christian, not how... You personally might define it based on your personal experience, on on how you might define it individually. It's by how scripture defines being a Christian or defines the calling. There are three attitudes, three heart postures that are appropriate uh, for someone who calls themselves a Christian. And the first in your outlines, we're just going to get right to it. We're just going to punch in the stomach, humility. (laughs) It begins with humility. Paul says to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility. There's a, there's a, 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 a lot of different directions that we could go in this context uh, talking about humility. But I think in context of Paul's writing here in, in Ephesians 4, maybe the most direct application of this kind of humility that Paul speaks of is the direct opposite of pride within us that says, I know best and my way is the right way. None of you say that, but I've heard it, okay? I've heard people say, um, I know best and my way is the right way. A true test of someone's humility, therefore, whether within the church, whether at home, whether in your marriage or at work, uh, virtually any relationship, if you wanna see how humble someone is, See how they respond when someone questions their authority or argues with their idea or when things aren't done their way, we'll see how humble they really are. And so I just suggest let's begin there. Let's maybe take some time this week and do some self-reflection, some self-analysis. Like, how do I feel when someone disagrees with me? How do I feel when someone says, I think you're wrong? How do I feel when someone says, well, we're going to do it this way, even though you want it done that way? Um, how do I respond in those situations? Does my blood pressure rise? If we were to take a, a measure of everyone right now, are we seeing some spikes right now? Like, ah, right? Are we feeling tense or irritable um, or rigid? How do I respond to people uh, when they disagree with me or when they say, no, I I think we're going to do it a different way. Uh, Do I speak up and do I argue my point? Do I fight to get my own way? Or are you like me and just passively, aggressively just shrink back and say, fine, you do it your way. You'll never hear from me again, right? And we just walk away. You see, a humble person remembers, this is really important for us to remember. A humble person remembers, I was once very opposed to God. There was a time in my life, I know it's hard for you to believe, I know, that Jeremy was opposed to God in virtually every way. And yet he forgave me. He reconciled me to himself through his son. So then how can I possibly respond to others who oppose me? You see, a humble person remembers there are multiple ways to think about something. There are multiple ways 
to possibly get the same job done, right? We had a, a large <clears throat> slab of concrete poured in my backyard in the house that I grew up in Southern California. It was for the purpose of turning it into a basketball court. It was awesome. Um, I did not get in trouble for that very reason. I was busy in the, my backyard playing basketball all day, every day. And so it was my job to sweep the court, clear it of leaves and debris and whatnot. And I remember one day, I was literally halfway done, doing a bang-up job sweeping. Oh, I was sweeping the heck out of that court. And my dad came outside and corrected the way I swept the court. And no, I was not as patient back then. I was not nearly as humble back then. And that turned into an altercation, right? You know, sometimes I think we take a, we take a, a similar prideful stance in the life of the church or in other aspects of our lives when, when people are, are doing things in a manner with which we disagree, when, when we don't see things the way they see them. And so in those moments, are we going to allow our pride to focus us on how we differ or will we humble ourselves? Will we consider, you know what, as long as they get the job done, as long as God is glorified, then hey, let's see if that works, right? There are multiple valid viewpoints on any given subject matter. And so let's, let's provide space for that. And ultimately, hope, humility reminds us, you know what? And this it reminds me, Jeremy, your will is not by default God's will, which means not by default everybody else's will is opposed to God's will. No, that's not true, right? We must all with humility be committed to seeking God's will before our own will. So we need humility. And then second in your outlines, we need to exhibit gentleness is what Paul talks about. Again, according to Paul's words here, <clears throat> walking in a manner worthy of the calling requires, he says, all humility and gentleness. He, 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 he lumps them together. This is one in the same, right? They go hand in hand. A humble person will respond with gentleness. They'll respond with respect to those with whom they may differ. Uh, while a prideful person will respond with angst, hostility, irritability, right? Remember what Jesus says in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Those are the humble. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he moves on. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Those are the gentle. You see, it's the humble and the gentle that will inherit all that God has for us, both here on earth and in heaven. And so again, how do we treat those who differ from us, who, who directly get on our nerves, who we just can't stand being around sometime, right? Do we snap at them with anger or frustration? Are we short with them? Again, are we passively aggressive and just avoid them altogether, right? Do we respond, however, maybe with some gentleness? Because we're so deeply moved by how gentle God has been with us. Keep in mind, and this is another important reminder, a very humbling reminder, you offend God way more than any other single person offends you. You do. I don't know if you know that, but we offend God way more than we get offended. So, wives, remember that the next time you think your husband isn't listening. Be gentle with him. Guys are like, thank you, you said it. I've been trying to tell her. Well, husbands, next time you think your wife is being disrespectful to you, be gentle to her. Be gentle. Children, next time you think your parents are nagging you and told you the thousandth time to clean your room, respond with gentleness. For those of us who work, remember your boss or that mean customer who treats you unfairly, be gentle. Be gentle with them. Let's all be, I know, that's asking too much, I know. Uh, <laughs> but let's all be gentle with one another. Why? God is so gentle with us. And then the third attitude of unity is patience. This is kind of like the holy trinity of Christian attitude. It's humility, gentleness, and patience. These are the appropriate manners of life for the Christian. So it's no coincidence then that, that when Paul talks about love within the context of church fellowship in 1 Corinthians 13, he says what? First and foremost, love is patient. Love is patient. 
for you uh, old schoolers, love is long suffering. I love that new or that King James translation of patience. It's long suffering because it does feel like you suffer for a long time sometimes, right? He says love is kind. It's gentle. Love does not envy or boast. It is humble. It is not arrogant or rude. It is gentle. It does not insist on its own way. It is humble. It isn't irritable or resentful. It is humble and gentle. The most common description of God in the Old Testament is this phrase, his steadfast love endures forever, which speaks of his patient, loving kindness to a people who do everything to deserve the opposite of his patient, long-suffering, and love. So when people give us every good reason to respond with frustration, to respond with short tempers, they deserve to be treated rudely, right? Can we let the love of God change us so profoundly that we respond with patience and therefore we walk in a manner worthy of our calling? And these three attitudes, this humility, gentleness, patience, then result in two behaviors. So these are the B's of the ABCs, okay? The first B is to bear with one another. Paul writes, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. So humility, gentleness, patience will enable us to do just that, to bear with one another in love. We'll, meaning we'll be able to look past other people's quirks. We'll be able to look past their weird idiosyncrasies, right? Those things that just kind of get on our nerves. No, we'll actually look past them in order to create and maintain unity. Why? Because it's out of love that we do this. And because the love of God has so radically transformed us that we don't, we don't nitpick. We don't become impatient. Think of it this way. This, is, this, this was profound. This was not my original thought. I heard this in a sermon not too long ago. And it was by some like British journalist or author or something. So this is not my original thought. But he brings up the point. If we were to just take everyone in this room, we would normally not have associated with one another and built relationships with one another had it not been for church. Think about that, right? Normally, we would not be each other's friends. We don't all run in the same social, social circles. We don't all have the same hobbies necessarily. Um, and so chances are, if this church never existed, we would not be friends and family. That's really interesting. And yet, here we are. <laughs> here we are. And now whether you like it or not, we're stuck with one another. So we got to make this work, right? We've got to, we got to take a hold of these words. Bearing with one another in love sometimes may take on a negative connotation. Like you may think, yeah, I got to put up with them for an hour and a half every Sunday morning, you know, in order to build relationship within the church. But that's not the case. This is, this is out of love, having the same mind, being of one spirit. That's exactly what Paul talks about. He says, bearing with one another in love, eager, eager to maintain unity in the spirit in the bond of peace. So rather than being like begrudgingly and resentfully obedient, like fine, I'll do it. No, like we're, this is the second behavior. We eagerly maintain unity. We seek to maintain unity. It's our heart's desire to maintain unity. It should be our deepest heart's desire for unity in the church. So much so that when division arises, we all come together and say, I hate that. I don't want any division. And so I'm going to do whatever it takes within my power to be a, a, a help, to, be, to help foster unity because we hate disunity so much. Just like we read in our uh, call to worship out of verse four, we are one body. We are one church. We have one Lord, one master. We are one people who believe in one holy Catholic apostolic faith and we should collectively hate anything that gets in the way of that. Therefore, we should be willing to do anything in our power to be reconcilers, to be peacemakers. 
to be maintainers of unity within the church. And we accomplish that if we're willing to adopt the two commitments that we're going to look at next. This is going to close out our ABCs of unity. So if you're in Ephesians, just turn one book to the right, or your right, and uh, turn to Philippians. We're just in chapter one in one verse. Philippians chapter one, verse 27. <clears throat> and Paul, again, is going to speak of a manner of life that will give us another perspective of how to maintain unity and how to strive together as it, as it speaks about in our vision statement. So in chapter one, verse 27, Paul writes this, only let your manner of life there's that phrase again, be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one faith with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And here we see Paul seemingly use similar language to that in Ephesians. And yet there's going to be some distinctions that we have to pay attention to. Uh, Paul says here, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So in Ephesians 4, he's establishing certain beliefs uh, and behaviors are appropriate for Christians. And then here in Philippians, he's going to just frame it slightly different in order to build out this thought even more. So keep in mind, those living in that Roman province of Philippi would have been particularly proud of their Roman citizenship. They're like the good old boys of Rome, right? They're like Rome, right? America. Like I'm bleeding red, white, and blue through and through, right? I don't know what their national colors were, but whatever they were, they bled it, right? And so Paul is going to use that frame of reference to speak about unity that their readers in Philippi would have been very familiar with, okay? So to start out, when Paul says, let your manner of life, he uses uh, the Greek word polituomai. That's where we get our word politics, right? He uses the word polituomai, which literally means behave as a citizen of. Behave as a citizen of, of wherever you are a citizen, right? So th those of you who travel abroad, hopefully, if you're humble enough, you'll quickly realize uh, we as Americans are very noticeable in other countries. We stand out like sore thumbs. And it's just that, that American spirit. It's the American vibe, right? That just, it annoys them and we just kind of relish in it. Like, I'm an American. So what? You're in our country, right? And so, um, but that American identity carries with it certain ways of doing things, certain ways of thinking through issues, right? And contrary to our own little ethnocentric attitude about all of this, there's a whole world out there that does things differently than we do. I know, shocking, right? Right? Those of you who are in construction, if you go to another country, you can't talk standard measurements. That, what's a foot? That means nothing, right? What, what's a mile? That, no, it's kilometers and meters and all these other numbers that make literally no sense. But the rest of the world thinks it does. And so, you know, it is what it is. So as Christians, here's the point. As Christians... Our, our, our American identity, our national identity, should never trump our Christian identity, no pun intended. Or, or put it in the context of our passage here, our heavenly citizenship supersedes our earthly national citizenship, right? We are citizens of God's kingdom before we are American citizens. Jesus is our king before Biden or any other politician is our president, thank the Lord. The Amen. The Bible is our standard before the Constitution, right? And therefore, we have to behave accordingly and in a manner worthy of what? The gospel of Christ. And this includes adopting certain attitudes, like we talked about, humility, gentleness, and patience. Those should be reflected then in certain behaviors, bearing with one another in love, right? Eagerly maintaining unity while we all to agree then to submit our lives to two primary commitments that Paul talks about in this passage. Again, keep in mind, these are commitments because if you've been at this Christian walk and if you've been in the life of the church for any given amount of time, you know there is something that wars against unity in the church no matter where you go. 
And so we must be committed to being maintainers of unity. So the first commitment in your outlines is to stand firmly united. To stand firmly united. Paul uses the Greek word steku. It means to be stationary or to persevere. Paul encourages the church that no matter what happens to him in the future, whether he's coming back or not, his greatest desire is to hear that despite the many obstacles that would war against the church's unity, the great poverty, right, the persecution, the outside influences of culture, that the church would stand firm in one spirit, that they would be stationary in their commitment to one another, that they would persevere to maintain unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Again, there are many obstacles to unity that we find today. They come from outside of the church, but they also come from within the church. And I think as I survey scripture, it seems that most division comes from within the church than from the outside. And we see this play out in the warnings of the New Testament, right? It's replete. We see warnings in Jude, in 2 Peter, in Paul's letters to Timothy, to the Philippians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Colossians, all talk about warnings against false teachers, false prophets, uh, uh, wolves in sheep's clothing who will come to infiltrate from within and divide and conquer. So we must stand firm in one spirit. We must be united in the essentials of the Christian faith and not allow others to come in and lead us into confusion and deception and disunity. And then the second commitment follows as well. We are to strive together for the gospel. Paul's desire is for the church to stand firmly in one spirit. And then he says, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. With one spirit, one mind, we have one goal, and that's to further the gospel. It's both in our lives, but also in the lives of others. It's the great commission that we have all been commanded to follow as followers of Jesus. And Paul then uses another very interesting Greek word um, to describe this, this striving together. And he uses the word in your outlines, soon athleo. It's where we get our word athletics, all right? Soon athleo. And it means to wrestle in company with or to seek and fight jointly, right? So my mind goes to like old WWF back on Saturday mornings, right? And you have tag team matches and they, you know these guys are warring against each other jointly. It gives the picture of individuals coming to fight against one common enemy. If you guys remember uh, several months ago in our series through Jude, we discovered like the coolest, manliest Greek word in all the in all the New Testament. You guys remember that word? Epagonizomai, right? You have to say it like that. You can't just say epagonizomai. Epagonizomai, right? It means to contend, to fight, right? This is another cool Greek word, real manly word um, that offers an insightful picture of how we maintain unity. It's by identifying the true enemy. It's by identifying the enemy and committing our lives to fighting that one enemy. And remember what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Our primary battle is not against fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's against the enemy of the church, and that is Satan. And when we allow him to deceive us into thinking that our sole problem is with one another, we have given ground. We have, we have given up in our fight to maintain unity. And that shouldn't cause us to forget that we are in a battle. We are in a fight. It's a spiritual battle, which you and I are being called to steku, to sinatleo. It's to stand firmly. 
It's to persevere. It's to strive together, fight together for the faith of the gospel. Because remember, our active commitment to unity as a church body speaks of the power of the gospel as much as our words do. So if we just talk about it, but we're not about it, that is not going to work. It's not going to get the job done. We're going to lose the fight if that's the case. So if we think that we can attract outsiders to the gospel, if we think we can attract others to the church and to a living relationship with the living God, but then all they see out there is disunity, all they see is faction and infighting within the church, what are they going to say? They're going to say what they always say. You guys are a bunch of hypocrites. You guys don't even practice what you preach. Why would I want to be a part of that? I'm perfectly happy being a hypocrite on my own. I don't need to join you and be a hypocrite. <laughs> there's a problem. There's, excuse me, there's not a problem. There's a poem by an unknown author that says this. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithful or true. Just what is the gospel according to you? Now, you and I don't get to relativize the gospel. That's not what this is saying. We don't get to make the gospel into whatever we want it to be. No, the gospel is the gospel. There's only one gospel, and scripture defines that. However, at the same time, you and I have the opportunity to show others how beautiful the gospel is. We get to show others how powerful and transformative the gospel is. You and I have the opportunity to commu communicate the gospel through our actions, how we treat others humbly and gently and with patience, through our attitudes, through our behaviors, through our commitments to strive together and to maintain unity within the church.